If you're like me, one of the best ways for me to start learning economics was to dive into books. But one of the biggest problems I faced is that there are so many books on economics. It's hard for me to know which one's going to produce the greatest value. So in this video, I wanna go through some popular economics books. I'm gonna give you my tier list, let you know which ones I think are the best and maybe the ones that you can skip for now. So I'm gonna group these books into four categories. I have behavioral economics, heterodox economics. I know I'm getting a a little dicey there. I'm gonna go for like a general economics flavor and then I'm gonna end with development economics. So I'm trying to get into not every economics book that's out there, but at least give you a sampling of where you might be interested in going. I know that there are so many other books out there. So if you wanna say like, hey, can you let me know your thoughts on these books? Go ahead and put it in the comments. Let me know, I can do another video like this. I would love to get your suggestions for good books to explore. And as you're watching, you can go down in the comments and see what other people have recommended. I'm gonna start with Predictably Irrational, which just has an iconic cover. Any Anytime you're in a Zoom conversation and they've got that bookcase in the background, you can spot that orange and blue spine and you know that man is a man of culture. That woman is a woman of intelligence because they read because they read predictably irrational. It's a good book. So I, let me give you a little summary before I introduce each of these books. Predictably Irrational is by Dan Ariely. Dan Ariely is a leading behavioral economist and he goes through and describes some of the research he and others have done in behavioral economics. So I remember liking this when I read it, but I would say right now, the only things that I remember from this book are actually like really gross. There's a whole chapter. It's a little edgier. It's really gross to me. Uh, I know this is going to be really good reverse psychology to get you to go read this book. So for me, there wasn't really a whole lot that stuck with me from this book. So on the tier list, I'm going to put this at a D. I know this is like starting off really bad. One of the most popular books in economics. It's on those shelves and I'm giving it a D to start off with. I keep looking down because I've got the stack of books right here. Let me go with Nudge next. Again, a classic. Of the books that I'm going to be talking about today, this is probably the one um, besides Freakonomics that has entered the most into our popular culture. This term nudge was just so good to describe what's going on. I guess I need to describe what's actually going on. Steve Levitt summed up the lessons from this book best. The other's insight I thought was a really good one, which is a lot of times it's just easier to trick people into doing what you want them to do than to actually, you know, either like educate them, uh, use information or or to change incentives. This book came out during the Obama administration or at least right before the Obama administration. I can't remember exactly. It was very influential. Like the a lot of people when this book came out were thinking about how you can incorporate nudges into improving policy, into delivering people to the outcome you wanted without forcing them to go there. I think over time though, that our evidence towards nudges has really waned, that we don't really have strong evidence that these nudges are persistent, that these are things that will continue to work after you implement them. And a lot of the early nudges might not have been as powerful as they were initially claiming. Nudge is great. It's I've got a special romantic attachment to Nudge. I talked about that in one of my first videos. It's still a pretty popular video, so I'll put a link up there. Not quite good enough for it to be up at the very top, so I think I'm going to put it at a B. The last book that I'm going to do in behavioral economics, you can't talk about behavioral economics without talking about Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman. Kahneman is, should I say, one of the OG behavioral economists, the OG behavioral economist. He and Amos Tversky were the ones that really pioneered behavioral economics back in the day. And this is his collected wisdom. You can see that this is just a much bigger book than like Nudge, Nudge, sits really tightly inside there because this is supposed to be a comprehensive what is going on in your brain. This has been hugely influential influential in the almost 10 years since it was released. You see it pop up time and again in people talking about marketing, people talking about just any aspect of decision making, thinking fast and slow comes up. There are parts of it they have not held up. That's one of the issues with behavioral economics is that we were really enthusiastic about it at the beginning. And then we've kind of realized that not all of the research at the beginning was sound. But overall, 
This is a book that has held the test of time. And frankly, it is at the caliber that you could use it as a textbook in a behavioral economics class. So I'm gonna put this at the S tier. Now, if you are interested in behavioral economics and wanna learn more, I've done a whole video on how behavioral economics is the best field of economics. And so if you want to dive into that and see some of the fun studies that have gone on looking at how our brains trick us into making funny decisions, go ahead and check that out. But the next one I want to get into is heterodox economics. I don't know if I have a good description of it. I did not have a good description of it. These are books that are inspired by Marxism. And if you watched my last tier list video, you know where Marxism lands. This is Capital in the 21st Century by Thomas Piketty or Thomas Piketty. This again, classic iconic cover. It's not as distinctive as predictably irrational, but you're gonna see this. I've seen this definitely on people's Zoom backgrounds. It just sits there. It's a really big signaling device. This was hugely influential when it came out back in, uh, it was 2015, I think that it came out. It spent three weeks in a row as the number one book on the New York Times bestseller, which is amazing. Again, look at how big this book is. Look, it just dwarfs so many other of the popular economics books that we have here. And it really is mostly about economic statistics and economic history and spent three weeks at the top of the New York Times bestseller list. Though some studies I believe showed that if you analyze how far people got on the Kindle, I don't think most people made it past 20%. So what is this book about? I, I keep talking about my hyping up the reception of the book without actually talking about what this book is about. So this goes into a study of the history of inequality. This came out just a few years after Occupy Wall Street and has been a continual fuel on the fire of this inequality or anti-inequality movement. A lot of people would straight away put this in F tier. A lot of people have called into question the work that has gone in this book, whether the claims are entirely accurate. Uh, I'm not gonna put it at F tier. I think it deserves better than that. You know, of course there's the other side that's gonna be like S tier. This is showing us how terrible the world is and how we need to change not putting it S tier either. If you are interested in economics, this is just not the book for you to get into. Like there are so many other books. It, it is a little bit more serious, so that's good. But in terms of like, hey, I like economics, maybe I should start reading more. If this is your next stop, you're gonna get stuck and it's not gonna be fun. There are a lot of better options if you wanna get into economics. So I'm putting this at C, which is convenient, C for capital, there you go. Next up is The Deficit Myth by Stephanie Kelton. This is about modern monetary theory. This has been one of the most requested topics in the history of market power. Can you do a video on MMT? MMT is a theory of uh, monetary policy. How do we use uh, the ability to print money to guide the economy? I am getting through this book right now. Uh, I don't have the full review. My goal is to do a full review of this book on this channel because I want to understand MMT. I mean, people are just talking about it so much. And so while the jury's out, uh, I, I already kind of feel like I know where this is going to end up. So the next set of books I'm going to look at are general economics books. I've got Naked Economics right off the bat. This one kind of grossed out my son. He saw that cover and he did not like it. He didn't even see the back where you get a little bit of cheek on it. And the other one is Undercover Economist. That actually is the only one I don't have on me. I have it on my digital reader, so that's unfortunate. But Undercover Economist and Naked Economics, they're both going through and giving you an idea of how to see economics in the real world. Like, hey, here's a coffee shop. What does that coffee shop tell us about economics? The topics actually in these two books are very similar. They have their different strengths though. So if I were to draw an indifference curve, um, my space was gonna be story and economic principles, I would place naked economics high on economic principles, but low on story. It's not necessarily like this driving, entertaining read. And Undercover Economist does a really good job. Tim Harford has great narrative as he's going through and spinning these stories for you. And I think the sacrifice is you're not getting as much in economic principles. You know, maybe Tim Harford disagrees, but I think that he did a good job of just really playing up the story, making it entertaining, making you want to read this book. Whereas Naked Economics does more on like, hey, let's make sure you get a really good understanding of all these economic principles and giving you a lot of examples. And so 
I would just put an indifference curve through both of them. I think they're actually both really good books depending on what you're looking for. I think if you're just starting out in economics, you've taken a high school economics class, maybe you're in an intro economics class in, in college, or maybe you're just starting to get into it. Both of these books are gonna do you well, but they're not the kind of books that are just gonna blow you away and say like, whoa, I have seen the world in a whole new way. It's really good for developing just basic economic insights. And that's great. Bread and butter, put it at B tier. Next one I have is actually the cartoon introduction to economics. This is by the stand-up economist, Yoram Bauman. This is, uh, it's like an economics textbook, but in comic book form. And I, and I like the idea. This was super innovative. I think he came out with this way before graphic novels were like as popular in culture as they are today. And even today, they're not as popular, but it, he just was like seeing where things were going and he got this one out there. I think it does work in a lot of ways, but like it's at a level where like you think it would be something accessible. I give it to my son, but it's hard for him to get into it. My son's nine. Like he's not going to understand all the words in here and it's not pitched as a book for nine year olds, but it would have been great to be able to give a comic book to my son that taught him economics and that would have really raised this in my rankings. I feel really bad giving this what I'm giving it, but I just let me just clarify all of the books here. Most of the books here that at least make it up past F tier are are great books. There, if you're interested in these topics, go ahead and read them. I'm putting it at C tier. I'm really sorry about that. I don't know, I just feel so bad. Okay, next up I have Freakonomics and Super Freakonomics. I'm gonna start with Super Freakonomics. The subtitle is Global <laughs> Patriotic Suits <laughs> and Why <laughs> Side Bombers Should Buy Life Insurance. I might actually just like bleep out what I just said and just have the writing up there because I'm so worried that I'm gonna get demonetized just for saying those kind of things. But it already tells you their goal with this book. They're trying really hard to be edgy. I remember getting this book because it was right after I decided to actually major in economics. But as I read it, I was just like, not very impressed. It felt like they were just trying so hard to be edgy and not as hard to be like edifying or like this is how you're going to learn economics is through the examples we're giving you here. I'm going to give it D tier. So next up is Freakonomics, the original. Freakonomics deserves credit just for how transformational it was, not just in my personal life, but across nonfiction and culture generally. I think this was this Freakonomics had a huge change in how we consume popular nonfiction. The summary of Freakonomics is this is a book. It's a little self-indulgent because it's about the research of the author Stephen Levitt. So Stephen Dubner went through and saw this guy's research. Hey, you're doing some interesting stuff. And he brought it together into this narrative that helped you learn about the how economics was exploring questions that you wouldn't normally apply to economics. But I think that where Freakonomics really shines is introducing people to the type of work that economists actually do. Economists aren't always just gathering data and looking at trends and prices. Economists are trying to identify causal effects. And we often rely on clever identification strategies for us to, to find those causal effects. Now, whether Freakonomics does the actual identification well or not, that's up for debate. But introducing that I think is what uh, we don't have very many books that give you that flavor at a level that's accessible to somebody really early on in economics. I read this book back in 2005 when I took my first economics class. In fact, this is a first edition copy of Freakonomics. I know, I mean, it's basically worth as much as a first edition holographic Charizard. But it, like when I was in high school, I was able to understand what was going on in this book. And it prepped me for later on when I started doing research in economics, how to think about these clever identification strategies. So Freakonomics has done the world a lot of good. Some people don't like it as much. I think some of the claims in Freakonomics don't hold up well over time. So it's been 16 years since it was published. I'm thinking like, let me know if you're interested. I know I already asked for a comment, but I'm thinking of doing a video of Freakonomics 16 years later. Like what were the claims made in Freakonomics? Do they hold up well over time? If you'd be interested in diving more into Freakonomics and what I think 16 years later, let me know in the comments below. But 
I'm gonna put this at an A tier. Well, that ties up the general economics books. Let me get into the economic development books. I just have two here with me today. I'm gonna to start with Why Nations Fail by Daron Asimoglu and James Robinson. It surveys the role of history and institutions in how successful a country is. I say history, they really are concerned with the role of institutions, the human devised rules that affect how countries are able to succeed or not. It's a political economy book. So if you're interested in political economy, I haven't quite done my video on that yet, but it's gonna come out. I have done a video on development economics as a field. If you're interested in that, I'll put the link up there. Why Nations Fail is a good book. It has a lot of theories that are solid. Some theories that don't hold up as well. I think I have some personal conflicts with this. A lot of my research is in this area. And I think some of the claims in here just don't hold up as well as they think. Now, I'm not as good of an economist as these guys. So, you know, it's I'm kind of not coming from a strong position to critique them. But I think that they try to go for general theories and make really strong claims when when you get into like the the granular details they don't hold up as well as they think but if you were interested in these questions of why are some countries rich why are some countries poor this is the best one i have all the ones i have here this is going to be the one that really dives into those topics so i think it's definitely worth a read i was thinking b tier for this one but i mean i'll, I'll put it a tier i'm going to be generous today give this thing an a tier and say it's worth your time definitely go check it out but also read it with a critical eye and say, what else could I learn? What have I seen in these countries? Doesn't match up with these theories. Next, I'm going for Poor Economics. This was written by Abhijit Banerjee and Esther Duflo quite some time ago, um, way before they got the Nobel Prize in Economics, which was just uh, a year or two ago. It's thinking about development economics, but not in the big picture way that Why Nations Fail does. Why Nations Fail is big picture, why are some countries poor, why are some countries rich? Poor economics is more on the micro level. What can we do to help poor families in developing countries? What are the barriers they face? Why do they make the choices they do? And what can we do to guide them out of poverty? They're really pitching the RCT aspect of this where you're gonna be experimentally going through and understanding what's happening in developing countries. Um, that's what they got their Nobel Prize for, was for the use of RCTs and understanding development. Um, this book has held up well 10 years later. It's a textbook level where I use this as a resource in my development economics class. Easy S tier. On this channel, I review a lot of books. If you're interested in looking at more of my suggestions on books, go ahead and check out this playlist right here. Or if you want to understand more about the different fields of economics, check out this playlist and we'll see you in the next video.